Um, our next speaker is Dr. Matt Malowski, who is part of the Memorial Sloan Kettering invasion of this year, of 2012. Um, he is our new section chief for genital urinary oncology. So um, first to start, thanks to the organizers, Dr. Murphy, Dr. Muss, for the invitation to speak today, and thank you, Dr. Carey, for moderating the session. Um, I'm going to speak about um, advanced bladder cancer and how we move this field forward. Uh, bladder cancer, unfortunately, we don't speak nearly enough about. This is not an uncommon disease with an estimated 70,000 or so cases in the United States every year. And it accounts for about 15,000 uh, bladder cancer deaths here. Uh, bladder cancer is also a disease of older individuals with multiple coexisting medical issues, uh, in part related to uh, smoking uh, and uh, often uh, cardiovascular disease uh, and other uh, comorbidities. And so it's a complex disease to speak to, uh, to treat. In addition to bladder cancer uh, being uh, a relatively common disease, it is uh, a staggering uh, expense to the, uh, to the economy. Uh, the cost uh, per patient of bladder cancer from diagnosis to death is the highest of all cancers. And overall, it's the fifth most expensive when looking at total medical care expenditure. And so I'm going to, I'm going to sort of start by uh, using a clinical states model to discuss this disease, much like we do with other diseases. Uh, bladder cancer, uh, I'm going to focus for, the, uh, for this talk on the issues of invasive bladder cancer and uh, metastatic disease. And the reason for that is because this is when the pendulum begins to sway away from death from other causes toward death from disease. And so what, what do we know about metastatic bladder cancer? Well, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, we know that cisplatin-based combination chemotherapy confers a survival benefit for patients with this disease. And back in the 80s, a four-drug regimen called MVAC, an acronym for four chemotherapy drugs, uh, demonstrated a survival benefit versus single-agent cisplatin and another combination regimen. And subsequently, in 2000, there was a paper published by Vondermas in the Journal of Clinical Oncology demonstrating similar outcomes as compared to the MVAC regimen with, uh, with less than the way of toxicity associated with the doublet chemotherapy. And so this doublet chemotherapy has subsequently become a standard of care in this disease. As you can see, the median survival is about 15 months uh, here. And uh, what you can see also is that there are uh, there is a tail on the curve. and so. There are patients who can, in fact, be cured with cisplatin-based combination chemotherapy in this disease on the order of somewhere between about 10 to 15 percent. So that's really the story when it comes to metastatic disease. What about invasive bladder cancer? Well, muscle invasive bladder cancer and uh, disease that is extravesical uh, is also a lethal phenotype, with greater than 50 percent of patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer ultimately going on to develop metastatic disease and succumbing to bladder cancer. One can see, and this is actually a single, institute, single surgical experience from the University of Southern California, 1,054 patients. And you can see how the survival falls off dramatically as patients develop extravesical disease or lymph node positive disease. This series, in fact, looks much better than other series. The five-year survival for patients with lymph node involvement is approximately 20 percent. And so is there anything we can do uh, for patients with invasive bladder cancer? Is there a role for perioperative chemotherapy, much like colon cancer, lung cancer, uh, and breast cancer? And the answer is yes. Uh, there is a role for neoadjuvants, this platin-based combination chemotherapy. This is the largest trial that's been done by the Europeans, the EORTC-MRC, a phase three trial looking at neoadjuvant CMV chemotherapy followed by a definitive therapy versus definitive therapy alone. And this uh, study at a median follow-up of eight years demonstrated a survival benefit for this combination with about a 14 percent proportional reduction in the risk of death. And these are the Kaplan-Meier survival curves. Uh, clearly a good study when you see uh, statistically significant improvement in overall survival, metastasis-free survival, local regional disease-free survival, and disease-free survival. There was also a study that was initially presented at ASCO in 2001 and subsequently published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2003. This is the Grossman trial. This is the intergroup 80 trial uh, looking at neoadjuvant MVAC chemotherapy uh, plus cystectomy uh, uh, or cystectomy alone in patients with uh, T2 through T4A disease. Uh, and this trial demonstrated, again, a survival benefit for the use of upfront cisplatin-based combination chemotherapy. And what was seen here is what is seen in other diseases, and Dr. Carey discussed the issue of a complete pathological response. And here, uh, in this trial, as well as in the MRC, ORTC trial that I just showed you, uh, those patients who uh, received chemotherapy had a 38 uh, percent pathological complete response, or a PT0 rate, as compared to only 15 percent of the patients uh, who underwent surgery alone. 
And if one looks here, you can see that there is an improvement in outcome uh, associated with this pathological complete response. In fact, most of the survival benefit that individuals derive is related uh, to this pathological complete response. Uh, and the 80, this is about an 85 percent five-year survival for patients who achieve a PT0 uh, at the time of radical cystectomy. So the first question really is, well, if that's the case, is there any way that we can predict for response to cisplatin-based chemotherapy? Uh, well, this has been looked at in other disease. It's not been looked at quite as well in bladder cancer. Uh, this is one study done by Joachim Belmont uh, in 57 patients with locally advanced or metastatic bladder cancer receiving cisplatin-based chemotherapy and looking at the question of ERCC1 by messenger RNA level. Uh, we know that ERCC1 is really pivotal, pivotal in nucleotide excision repair. Uh, and uh, increased expression is related to the cisplatin uh, 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 resistant phenotype. And uh, what Dr. Belmont demonstrated is that uh, low levels of ERCC1 expression are associated with improvement in outcome with cisplatin based chemotherapy. What about other uh, enzymes that are involved in DNA repair processes? Well, this is a study uh, looking at BRC1 mRNA expression in uh, paraffin uh, in patients that receive neoadjuvant or. Uh, or chemotherapy in the setting of metastatic disease against this platin-based chemotherapy. And here one can see that the pathological uh, complete response rate is higher in those patients with lower levels of BRCA1 uh, expression, uh, indicating that uh, uh, unable to pair those uh, DNA uh, 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 breaks uh, uh, by cisplatin. And in fact, uh, here's the overall survival curve uh, for this trial, again, demonstrating that lower levels of BRCA1 uh, are associated with improvement in survival when patients are receiving cisplatin-based combination chemotherapy. And so we do have a couple of markers that are potentially promising to be able to predict platinum response. Uh, there's uh, other uh, looks at pharmacogenomics in this disease. This is work done by Peter O'Donnell at the University of Chicago, uh, looking at uh, specific uh, SNPs that appear to predict for uh, platinum sensitivity. He's looked in uh, ovarian cancer, uh, and also uh, this is uh, several of the SNPs that have been uh, demonstrated to predict response to platinum and bladder cancer. Uh, when I was at Memorial, I was involved in a project with David Gallagher, who is uh, back in Dublin now, looking at germline SNPs and response to urethelial carcinoma of platinum-based therapy. And here, this was uh, work that was done out of a genome-wide association study uh, where we took 210 patients that had received platinum-based chemotherapy, either in the metastatic or the neoadjuvant setting, and uh, we then um, genotyped those patients for 80 candidate SNPs and came up with six SNPs that were significant for platinum response and then created a SNP score to be able to predict for response to cisplatin-based chemotherapy. And so pharmacogenomics may, may have a role in being able to predict platinum response in this population as well. So I don't think we should throw platinum out, but platinum has a lot of issues in this disease. Again, older age, multiple coexisting medical problems, and actually on the order of about 40 to 50 percent of patients are not eligible uh, to be able to receive cisplatin-based chemotherapy. So we clearly need uh, novel therapies, and we need to do better. And so that's why I called this talk Moving the Field Forward. That's what I think we need to do. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk about bladder cancer. We don't hear much about it. We don't uh, think about it very much. This is uh, a view from a urologist's uh, cystoscope looking at the uh, bladder. This is ruddy complexion consistent with carcinoma in situ. And uh, we're all familiar with the concept of the field cancerization effect in bladder cancer or polychronotropism, the uh, development of synchronous and metachronous tumors in the bladder, making it a very difficult disease to treat and also contributes to the incredible expense uh, to the economy because patients need to be followed lifelong by the urologist with urine cytologies, cystoscopies, urine cytologies, and then, of course, those patients that go on to develop more advanced disease require cystectomy and additional therapies uh, in the setting of metastatic disease. What's really interesting, though, is that we've known more about bladder cancer in terms of its biology than we have about many other cancers. Um, we just haven't sort of done much with it uh, up until now. Uh, and so what we've known about bladder cancer is that early stage disease is typically characterized by alterations in FGFR3 or HRAS, and these are typically the non-invasive tumors or the superficial disease, uh, where patients with more advanced disease are typically characterized. This is the muscle invasive plus with alterations in major tumor suppressors such as P53RB or P10, and of course additional alterations occur once the patients go on to develop a more invasive and metastatic phenotype. And so we, um, like others, are interested in using functional genomic approaches to be able to better characterize these tumors, and uh, I've been involved in work uh, looking at different approaches uh, with the Solid Lab at Memorial and 
I'm uh, happy to say that we're beginning to work on some of these uh, projects now with, with uh, Dr. Billy Kim, uh, who's uh, been uh, part of the major bladder cancer TCGA effort, where that data will actually be uh, available uh, within the next several months. And so um, using an approach, uh, doing mutational analysis, using sequinome technology as well as conventional Sanger sequencing as well as array-based comparative genomic hybridization to look at copy number alterations in tumors as well as DNA methylation, we sought to characterize uh, bladder tumors for alterations that were potentially targetable. And so I'm just going to put up uh, a little data just to demonstrate that I'm excited about the direction that we're heading in this disease. Um, this is um, a heat map looking at uh, here, uh, 97 or so tumors uh, for which uh, a series of genes uh, were looked at. Um, these are green mutations, the amplifications and deletions. And you can see that there are many uh, genes, uh, many of which are potentially targetable by drugs that are already available being used in other diseases or actively being looked at in the context of clinical trials. If we look at this uh, by tumor subset, uh, you can see that uh, here are the receptors and downstream elements. Uh, FGFR3, ERB2, MET, BRAF, NF1, MIC, you can see that there's not uh, much in the way of overlap uh, here. The same within the P3 kinase AKT, uh, mTOR pathway. Uh, here are some DNA uh, repair uh, uh, genes and uh, looking at cell cycle control, perhaps a little bit more in the way of overlap, uh, likely related to the inherent genomic instability within these tumors. Uh, we can group these by high copy number and low copy number, and you can see that certain gene uh, alterations uh, seem to segregate with high and low copy number, uh, those with p53 mutations here uh, as compared to um, the FGFR3 mutations in low copy number set. Um, again, these are typically seen more often in the lower grade non-invasive type tumors. We also uh, found uh, uh, ERB2 uh, amplification in uh, several tumors. Here we had five within this 97. Uh, set of invasive high-grade tumors. This is uh, an obvious target uh, that has been exploited in breast cancer, more recently in gastric cancer. This was confirmed by immunohistochemistry and by looking at fluorescent in situ hybridization. So uh, Herceptin uh, or uh, trastuzumab or lapatinib, uh, potentially drugs that we should be looking at in patients who have uh, ERB2 amplification in this disease. And then you could look at the uh, mutation and copy number data organized by histologic subtypes. It appears that um, there are certain uh, genetic events that uh, occur within these subtypes, for example, uh, in those individuals, actually this is not, uh, in those individuals with, um, with uh, as an example, papillary exophytic component, which are more characteristic of lower grade tumors, have more in the way of FGFR3 alterations. And you can see in some of the run of the mill urothelial carcinoma, we see P53 mutations. Here are the tumors with divergent differentiation, so either squamous or adenotype features. Uh, and then we had a small subset of patients that had small cell carcinomas in the bladder. And you can see there were p53 mutations seen in those, as well as E2F3 amplification, which likely phenocopies uh, the RB loss that's pathognomonic for small cell carcinoma uh, in lung cancer. And so uh, I think that hopefully I've convinced you that there are, in fact, targets in bladder cancer. We ought to start looking for some of those targets, and, and we actively are. Uh, you can see here that certainly for FGF, there are drugs, uh, TKI258 or Divitinib, unfortunately, did not have uh, activity in FGFR3 mutant tumors. Uh, if we look at the, the uh, ERB2, we talked about amplification, certainly drugs that are available and actively being used in other diseases. We found two uh, v 600 b BRAF mutations, so Vemurafidib or PLX4032 may have a place in the treatment of patients uh, who have BRAF mutations. Uh, and, of course, uh, multiple alterations within the P3 kinase AKT mTOR pathway such that drugs that are either uh, targeting P3 kinase or dual P3 kinase mTOR inhibitors uh, or TORC1 inhibitors alone may have a place in this disease. And, in fact, um, you know, w w this is what I believe we've learned so far, and obviously we have a lot of more work to do. High-grade high bladder cancer appears to be a targetable disease. Non-overlapping patterns of alterations suggest dependence on specific pathways for maintaining a tumor phenotype, and prospective genotyping can identify um, patients with targetable alterations and potentially stratify them to appropriate clinical trials. And so this is one piece of work that was recently published, a trial that uh, I actually ran uh, at Memorial looking at uh, Averolimus, a TORC1 inhibitor in patients with advanced bladder cancer who had progressed after uh, chemotherapy. 
These patients typically have a response rate to conventional chemotherapy of 10 to 20 percent. Their progression-free survival is on the order of two to three months, and their overall survival is really no more than about six months. And here we had a patient uh, who had about now a two-year response to single-agent uh, TORC1 inhibition with Avirolimus, who uh, we performed whole genome on and demonstrated this patient had a TSC1 uh, mutation. Uh, and then we went back and we looked at a series of the other patients uh, for TSC1 alterations and found that, in fact, there were several patients that had TSC1 alterations that appeared to correlate with minor response to, uh, to Avirolimus. And so Dr. Carey mentioned uh, the issue of pathological complete response and accelerated drug approval in early breast cancer. Um, the FDA may grant accelerated approval on the basis of a surrogate endpoint that is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. And for neoadjuvant breast cancer treatment, we propose that the rate of pathological complete response be used as the surrogate. This came from Dr. Pazder at the FDA. That's a pretty good uh, endorsement. Uh, and so I'm going to try to endorse uh, this bladder cancer, and I think that there's tremendous rationale uh, to begin to think of this, and I hope that uh, some of the scientists in this audience uh, can potentially help us along uh, in doing this. In spite of the evidence supporting a benefit with neoadjuvant chemotherapy in muscle invasive bladder cancer, the utilization of cisplatin-based chemotherapy is dismal, highlighting the need for the development of novel approaches to management in this disease. Number two, approximately 50 percent of patients are ineligible for cisplatin-based chemotherapy due to renal dysfunction, impaired performance status, and or coexisting medical problems. Number three, pathological response has been clearly demonstrated to predict for improved outcome in patients with muscle invasive disease. Uh, tumor tissue collection in patients with bladder cancer, this is for the scientists in the audience, is performed as standard of care. So we don't need research-directed biopsies in this disease. Um, we have the ability to perform correlative studies as part of standard of care. Urologists do cystoscopies of large muscle invasive tumors. Uh, that is standard of care, and patients then undergo cystectomy. Uh, and that, again, is standard of care in the management of this disease. And finally, the new adjuvant model in muscle invasive bladder cancer has several additional advantages. It does for other diseases as well, including a greater likelihood of successful therapy in an earlier disease state that may be characterized by less genomic instability as compared to the advanced metastatic setting with an early readout of activity with results determined in months rather than years. And so uh, this is uh, an early neoadjuvant trial design. This can be applied to many diseases. I made the point here that this is standard of care, this is standard of care, this is where you get your tissue to do the analyses. Uh, Dr. Billy Kim and I have already proposed the trial that uh, one company appears interested looking at dual MEK AKT inhibition in this disease, and we hope to do a bunch of exciting correlative studies and to start to um, use this neoadjuvant platform to uh, perform studies at UNC uh, looking at novel agents and novel targets in this disease. And with that, uh, I'll end. Thank you.